Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ed Jurechin, the director of the Baker Institute here at Rice University, and I want to warmly welcome you to this special event. The great outpouring of interest, as we can see from the audience. Uh, the Vietnam War, uh, 50 years on. I would like to recognize the outstanding work of the Baker Institute Roundtable Young Professionals who have put together this unique program, highlighting the strong connections between the Institute and the Rice Veterans and Business Association at the Jones Graduate School of Business. It has truly been a privilege to watch the influx of military veterans on Rice's campus take an interest in the work of our Baker Institute. I remember the day Mike Friedman, who is one of our emerging leaders, came to my office, he's a Green Beret, and said he had an offer I couldn't refuse. Since I still value my life, I said, what do you want? <laughs> he and his, and I've actually just said yes to everything else he's asked me for. He and his colleagues have brought real new energy and determination and succeeded in growing the Institute's young professional membership group from around 50 members two years ago. And we were really struggling to get young members to join to over 300 active members today. So I really thank you all for that. Mm -hmm. Tonight's event is further evidence of their skill and creativity by bringing together four very distinguished authors to assess the legacy and lessons of one of the most controversial conflicts in our nation's history through a literary perspective. I look forward, as we all do, to a most interesting discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming my good colleague, the Dean of the Jones Graduate School of Business, Bill Glick, whom I also thank warmly for co-hosting this event here at McNair Hall. Thank you, Ambassador Dridgen, and welcome to everybody here to the Jones Graduate uh, School of Business. As the Dean of the, the Jones School, it's been my, my, been my honor to have you join us for this joint event with the Baker Institute. And I'd like to thank, start by thanking uh, our generous uh, sponsors who made this event possible. Chevron, Next Op, Shell, Phillips 66, the Jones uh, Partners, ConocoPhillips, and Spectra Energy. So thank you very much for, for your support. <laughs> the Jones School has been very proud to support the veterans community. Uh, and part of that's been spurred on by the formation of the Veterans and Business Association in, as recently as 2011. Uh, and together with the Jones School, we set a goal of becoming the most veteran-friendly MBA program. Uh, and I feel that we've made tremendous progress. Uh, with the generous support of donors uh, through the Military Scholars Program and the active en engagement of the Houston employers and the broader veterans community, uh, we've welcomed a lot of veterans to our program uh, and now have more, we're very fortunate to have more veterans in the program than we ever anticipated. So that's, that's been a wonderful addition. But more importantly for us is that we've been able to see that uh, once the veterans got here, they made a difference. Surprise. Uh, the veterans have made a tremendous, uh, taken on tremendous leadership roles within student body, but they've also then gone on to be highly valued uh, uh, graduates. They enrich Rice, they enrich Houston, and the broader community. So we're very grateful to have them. And thank you to everybody who's supporting the veterans here at Rice. Thank you. So through, through the uh, programs like tonight, we've been able to connect Houston to what Rice and the Jones School have to offer the veterans community. I'm very proud and excited for this opportunity to join forces with the Baker Institute for the event, which really speaks profoundly to the veterans' experience in a way that many of us have never known in the past. So we, we greatly appreciate what our authors have to say and the, the discussions that go on. So now it's uh, my honor to welcome one of our main event organizers, Jones School alum, uh, Mike Friedman. Uh, I'll be quick. This is the last speech of the evening. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the idea for this event came from the Rice Veterans and Business Association, the Baker Institute's Associate Roundtable. 
It was in part driven by the huge influx of veteran students at Rice at both the Jones School and veteran members of the Baker Institute from the recent wars of the post 9-11 era. So it is that we thought it would be a neat, non-sentimental, sort of non-cheesy way of honoring the Vietnam veterans for their service as the war turned 50, while also exploring the human cost of foreign policy and what it's like to go to war as a soldier. And this is why we decided to invite four literary fiction writers rather than four politicians or four historians to help us better connect to the experience of being an infantryman or in the special forces as these guys did and the legacy that that has on the individual who experiences it. And what a group of writers we have this historic evening, the four of which have never have shockingly never appeared on the same stage together until tonight. In closing, although Philip Caputo, Larry Hindman, Tim O'Brien, and Tobias Wolf are four of the most famous Vietnam veteran writers, I think it's important to make the distinction that they are simply four great writers who sometimes use the setting of war to explore broader themes, no different than Melville or Joseph Conrad used the sea to touch on the human condition and hence the reputation as four of the greatest writers of the last 50 years in American literature. And there, and there ends my lecture on that. But uh, so moderating our panel tonight will be Josh Brewer, uh, who after attending the Naval Academy studied at Oxford University for two years before serving out in the fleet as a military intelligence officer. He then worked as an investment banker in New York City for Goldman Sachs for almost a decade before founding his own company, FlexGen Power Systems, in which he serves as the CEO. Ladies and gentlemen, help me give a warm rice out welcome to Josh Peru and four of the greatest living writers in America, Philip Caputo, Larry Hyman, Tim O'Brien, Tobias Wolf. Great, thanks very much, Mike. As Mike said, I'm Josh Preer. I've got the uh, pleasure of moderating tonight's discussion. I won't add my thanks to the great uh, list of writers we have here tonight, but my job is to keep things moving and generally stay out of the way. So I'm gonna review kind of the agenda. What we're gonna do is introduce each of the writers in alphabetical order. Uh, they've uh, agreed to read an excerpt from their works uh, for us tonight. We're gonna go down the line and do that, and then we'll have a little bit of a moderated Q&A discussion. There are ushers throughout the room, and maybe ushers could stick a paw up in the air here and identify yourselves, who have note cards. So if you have questions that you would like to pose to any of the authors, please flag them down, uh, write them down, and uh, hand them back to the ushers, and we'll take those at the end. And hopefully we'll leave enough time for a few of those so we can maximize audience interaction. Um, I think that's it. The only other note I'll just remind you is we are whether this event is going to be followed immediately by a book signing across the terrace back in the Baker Institute. So I'm going to ask everyone to stay seated uh, while the authors exit out the back, get stationed over there, and then we can uh, we can bum rush them on the other side of the terrace when it's all done. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, our first guest is known throughout the world as a chronicler of both men and war in both fiction and nonfiction, the latter including his famous memoir, A Rumor of War, about his tour in Vietnam as a Marine Corps infantry officer, which has been published in over 15 languages and sold over 2 million copies. If you're in Cuba, however, the name Philip Caputo is best known as the record holder for the largest blue marlin ever caught at 569 pounds. Uh, <laughs> Largest, the largest in Cuba. Per, in Cuba, he's quick to humbly mention. However, even more importantly, he bested, he, he bested the, previous, <laughs> the, the, the previous record holder who was Ernest Hemingway. Uh, <laughs> Born in Chicago, uh, Phil Caputo attended Loyola University. After his service as an in infantry officer in the Marine Corps, he worked as a journalist for 10 years, win winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1972 while at the Chicago Tribune. He's covered many wars, perhaps most notably, the Lebanon conflict of the 1970s where he was shot in the ankle and received some shrapnel wounds as well, I believe. He's the author of eight novels, including the best-selling Acts of Faith and Horn of Africa, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and to which the movie rights were just sold. Phil has also worked as a screenwriter, lectured at universities, and published, dozens of in, published in dozens of major magazines, uh, newspapers and periodicals, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and Esquire magazine. Recently, his nonfiction account of traveling around the Americas, The Longest Road, was a New York Times bestseller. And like any Marine, even though now in his 70s, he's still known to get in the boxing ring. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Philip Caputo.
so many people to thank. I'll just say thank you, everybody, for uh, inviting us here, and we, we've had a delightful time. As um, and uh, as uh, Josh mentioned, um, I did a 16-month tour in Vietnam as a uh, Marine infantry infantry officer, and about half of that time was as a rifle platoon commander, and about half of that time was uh, as a junior staff officer in various uh, billets, various functions. Um, one of which uh, was that of casualty reporting officer for our uh, battalion. And in that capacity, what I did was, was to take reports from the field of Marines who had been killed or wounded. And in addition, uh, I kept track of what was then known as the body count of the number of enemy that we had killed. And, as we, and then I would take how many we had lost to how many they had lost, and I would compute what was called the kill ratio. Um, this, uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from uh, uh, this period, rather than the period I actually served in a frontline combat outfit, because I think it expresses more of what we're here for, to talk about the emotional and psychological impact of war on the individual. Um, and I want to point out that the reason I'm reading this is, is that one of those duties that I had <clears throat> as a casualty reporting officer was to identify the bodies of dead Marines who could not otherwise be identified. Um, you can figure out why that was true. And one night, uh, three Marines from my old platoon were killed when a, uh, a Viet Cong uh, infiltrator uh, threw a grenade inside their bunker and set off all the grenades that they had in the bunker. And uh, you can imagine what this did to them. <clears throat> and so I had to go down and um, uh, identify them. Um, I have to give that background so that this excerpt I'm going to read makes some sense to you. And. Uh, I think that that period of, of my service affected me psychologically and emotionally way more than did actually leading men in combat. That night I was given command of a new platoon. They stood in formation in the rain, three ranks deep. I stood front and center facing them. Devlin, Lockhart, and Bryce were in the first rank, Bryce standing on his one good leg, next to him the faceless Devlin, and then Lockhart with his bruised eye socks bulging. Sullivan was there too, and Reasoner, and all the others, all of them dead except me, the officer in charge of the dead. I was the only one alive and whole, and when I commanded platoon, right face, sling arms, forward march, they faced right, slung their rifles, and began to march. They marched along, my platoon of crippled corpses, hopping along in the stumps of their legs, swinging the stumps of their arms, keeping perfect time while I counted cadence. I was proud of them. Disciplined soldiers to and beyond the end, they stayed in step even in death. I woke up soaked in sweat and afraid. I wasn't sure if I had been dreaming and it seemed so real. Even when I realized that it had only been a dream, the fear remained. It was the same fear I had felt after Sullivan's death. A mortar tube fired in the distance. I started counting, thousand one, thousand two, thousand three. Usually it took 20 seconds for a mortar shell to reach its target, but nothing happened. The shell exploded away off somewhere. It was one of our own mortars. Relieved, I smoked a cigarette, cupping it with my hands so the burning tip would not show through the cracks in the tent. Then, still afraid, I fell into an uneasy sleep. In the morning, the sun was hovering just over the line of palms beyond Highway 1, and, uh, and farmers were out working in the fields, near the howitzer batteries across the dirt road. Waking with the sight of those marching corpses still in my mind like an afterimage, I swung off my cot. I saw the new sun and the farmers plowing in the green paddies by the now silent guns. But nothing my eyes saw could blur that persistent vision of dead men marching. Shaving at the improvised washstand outside the tent, I saw their faces in the mirror and, re and reflected in my own face. I saw them when I put on my jacket, stiff and white with dried sweat, and when I urinated into one of the acrid-smelling piss tubes. 
And when I walked to the mess for breakfast, hopping over the drainage ditch where the mud from last night's rain was cracked and drying. All these familiar things, the tube with its stench, the feel of the salt stiffened jacket against my back, the worn footpath leading over the ditch to the mess told me I was back in the world of concrete realities where dead men do not rise. So why was the picture of Bryce, Devlin, Lockhart, and the others still so clear? And why did the dream still seem so real? And why, when there was no menace, was I still afraid? I went through the chow line and sat down across from Lieutenants Mora and Harrison. The yolks of the eggs in my tray looked like two yellow eyes set in a slimy white face. I mashed them with my fork and tried to eat. Mora and Harrison were talking about a regimental operation that was coming up in a couple of days. It was to be a combined Arvin Marine operation, aggressively codenamed Operation Blastout. I ate and listened to them and felt the mental bisection that comes from smoking the strong marijuana the bar girls in Vietnam called Buddha grass. Half of me was in the mess listening to two officers talking of practical military matters, of axes of advance and landing zones, and the other half was on the dream drill field where legless, armless, eyeless men marched to my commands. Up, two, three, four, you left if you've got a left. And then they vanished, suddenly. I saw Morris and Harrison prefigured in death. I saw their living faces across from me and superimposed on those, a vision of their faces as they would look in death. It was a kind of double exposure. I saw their living mouths moving in conversation and their dead mouths grinning the taut drawn grins of corpses. Their living eyes I saw and their dead eyes still staring. Had it not been for the fear that I was going crazy, I would have found it an interesting experience. A trip such as no drug could possibly produce, asleep and dreaming I saw dead men living, awake I saw living men dead. The worst part of this uh, job that I had was some months later, when I had to identify the body and take the report of my best friend from officer's basic school at Quantico, Virginia, a, uh, an officer named Lieutenant Walt Levy. Um, his death of, of affected me um, very deeply and does to this day. Not too long ago, I was at a reunion in Washington, and I went to the wall, and I saw Walt's name there, and 40-some uh, years after the event, I just started bawling like a child. Um, I don't know why that is, uh, but, uh, but it nevertheless was true. And um, after I had taken that report, I had vaguely remembered a moment when he and I were at Quantico and we were in Washington and we were drinking and we were at a bar in D.C. in Georgetown, and uh, we were, you know, hustling girls and all that kind of marine stuff. And, um, um, and, 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 and in this memory, I saw Walt bending down to speak to me, but I couldn't remember what he said. And uh, when I finally came around to writing this book, I wrote this eulogy for him, and it's, it's not too long, and I'd like to read it to you. I still could not remember what he had said to me that night in Georgetown. It could not have been important, yet I wanted to remember. I want to remember now, to remember what you said, you, Walter Neville Levy, whose ghost haunts me still. No, it could not have been anything important or profound, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that you were alive then, and speaking, alive and speaking. And if I could remember what you said, I could make you speak again on this page and perhaps make you seem as alive to others as you still seem to me. So much was lost with you. So much talent and intelligence and decency. You were the first from our class of 1964 to die. There were others, but you were the first and more. You embodied the best that was in us. You were a part of us and a part of us died with you. The small part that was still young that had not yet grown cynical, grown bitter, grown old with death. 
Your courage was an example to us, and whatever the rights or wrongs of the war, nothing can diminish the rightness of what you tried to do. Yours was the greater love. You died for the man you tried to save, and you died pro patria. It was not altogether sweet and fitting, your death, but I'm sure you died believing it was pro patria. You were faithful, your country is not. As I write this 11 years after your death, the country for which you died wishes to forget the war in which you died. Its very name is a curse. There are no monuments to its heroes, no statues in small town squares and city parks, no plaques, nor public wreaths, nor memorials. For plaques and wreaths and memorials are reminders, and they would make it harder for your country to sink into the amnesia for which it longs. It wishes to forget, and it has forgotten. But there are a few of us who do remember because of the small things that made us love you, your gestures, the words you spoke, and the way you looked. We loved you for what you were and what you stood for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Our next guest, although hailing like Phil from Chicago, has a strong connection to Texas, serving for the last decade as the professor of creative writing at Texas A&M University, where he's shaped both the minds and hairstyles of a generation of Aggies. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about, about Larry Heineman, who exploded onto the American literary scene in 1987 when his novel Paco's Story about Vietnam uh, beat out Nobel Prize laureate Toni Morrison's novel Beloved for the National Book Award. In the debate that typically follows such awards, uh, Larry famously quipped in his most terse Hemingway style that the award check has already been cashed and the Louise Nevelson sculpture was not likely to be returned. Both Paco's story and his novel Close Quarters draw on his combat experiences while serving in the Army as an infantryman in Vietnam. He is also the author of the well-received Black Virgin Mountain and Cooler by the Lake. Larry's short stories and nonfiction have appeared in publications including the Atlantic Monthly and Harper's, and he's the recipient of fellowships and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and a Fulbright scholarship to return to Vietnam, where he's become friends with many Vietnamese veterans and Vietnamese writers of that conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the legendary Larry Heineman. <laughs> There's a bit of tape right here that, that you can't see, but is large letters that says, speak, please speak directly into the mic. Here you go. <clears throat> um, maybe the only thing that uh, you need to know about me as a writer um, <clears throat> I was a draftee. Being in the Army was the last thing on my mind. Uh, if you don't mind the language, I'll put it this way. I was pissed off to be drafted, pissed off to be in the Army. I was pissed off the day I went overseas, and I was really pissed off when I got home. I was so pissed off that I didn't know who to be pissed off at, so I was pissed off at everybody. <clears throat> the second thing you need to know, heavens to bed. Can I have the uh, that thing of water? Waiting to read all day is really dry work. The other thing that you need to know <coughs> is that it is a remarkable irony uh, that I became a writer. It's a remarkable irony of the war. Um, if it hadn't been for the war, for my war year, 
Uh, I'd be driving a bus like my old man. Uh, this irony is something that I share with a number of other uh, riot, uh, Vietnam veterans who came home and wrote about that, uh, writers and poets and scholars and teachers. And um, the Vietnamese veterans that I know, uh, many of them say the same thing. So the, uh, the writing turns out to be a kind of uh, odd, a product of an odd ambivalence. Um, when I was working on Paco's story, uh, my editor, who was a very tall, elegant woman, uh, much smarter than I was, M, I was then and still am, uh, still is, uh, she said, called me one day and she said, Larry, why is your writing so angry? And uh, without missing a beat, I said, uh, uh, I want to take the war and shove it up somebody's ass. Leave it at that. Now I know that the uh, the uh, uh, the whole point of the evening uh, is to somehow acknowledge with a kind of puzzlement and embarrassment and uh, six or eight other things I can't think of just this uh, minute about the beginning of the war. Uh, what I want to read uh, has to do with the last day of the war. <coughs> and it goes something like this. And for those of you who don't uh, uh, know the full story of the last day of the war, which was April 30th, 1975, um, when it was finally accomplished, I don't know about any other veterans in the room, but... Uh, when it was finally accomplished, I felt as if a stone had been lifted from my heart. And it goes like this. It's, it's, it's a platoon of three tanks that sort of blow their way onto the uh, compound of the presidential palace. <clears throat> The tanks skid to a halt within an ace of the porch steps and the overhanging eaves. The drivers slam the gear shifts into park and stand up in their hatches, laughing, laughing, laughing. This is fucking sweet, brother. Welcome to fucking Saigon. Where's the fucking rice wine? One of the tankers, the platoon commander, a lieutenant, pops out of his hatch Excited, giddy, he wants to dance. Slaps a tightly folded flag under his arms and whips out a pistol. Then he and his gunner, also with pistol in hand, everything locked and loaded, we're not out of the woods just yet, bub, dismount and walk up the stairs straight into the building. Let's put an end to this bullshit. How odd it seems to be on foot. Inside, General Duong Vong Big Ming, only lately president, walks at the head of a skittish entourage of rear rank government ministers and back office flunkies toward the two North Vietnamese tankers, moved by sheer human curiosity and accompanied by bowel shrinking dread. Ming's only purpose just that moment is to end the killing once and for all with the formal capitulation of the government. For 20 years, the best our money could buy. The tankers self-consciously kick off their sandals before they step onto the long and luscious yellow carpet and approach the new president and his escorts. But before Big Ming can uh, say two words, the guy with the flag, still wearing his tanker's helmet, 
uh, which resembles an old-fashioned leather football helmet with long ear flaps and a chin strap, holding his pistol level and walking with clear purpose, tells men to shit-can the small talk, save it, pal, and asks the way to the roof. The what? Big Men believes he has misheard. Perhaps they mean the lavatory. But, uh, but why would you want to go to the roof to take a whiz? It is as if the preacher officiating, a, officiating at a society wedding uh, were suddenly to launch into a dreamy monologue about the contrary philosophies of draw poker. Then in sheer relief and baffled exasperation, Ming hooks his thumbs over his shoulder and has one of his petrified, bottom-rung, extremely junior assistant deputies show our brothers from the other side the way to the roof. The three of them take off down the wide palace hallway at a trot, leap up the stairs, taking them three at a time. The tankers begin to whoop like kids. The clerk, some pencil-necked drudge from finance, perhaps, a job his family bought him years ago, simply assumes he's going to be shot. I've been good. Why me? Finally on the roof and out into the bright and hot, hot, heavy noontime air above the city and to the purgative uh, relief of the clerk, tankers walk straight to the flagpole at the front of the building. Magically, as if enchanted, the air above the palace grounds is thick with the whip and buzz of dragonflies. The soldiers haul down the South Vietnamese flag, three red stripes on a bright yellow field with long snappy reaches of their arms. Then they raise the ensign of the provisional revolutionary government, red and blue with a large yellow star commonly referred to as the VC flag sharply salute with bold adolescent intensity, and a cheer rises from everyone standing within sight of it. It is 12.15 p.m., April 30, 1975. <clears throat> One could easily imagine such a cheer rising on Iwo Jima from the Marines scattered up and down the beach among the putrid, volcanic gravel dunes as half a dozen guys stood finally at the heights of Suribachi, tied the stars and stripes to a 20-foot piece of pipe and muscled it aloft. Or the rip-roaring hurrah that rolled along the Carolina roadsides when one of General Sherman's supernumerary orderlies pounded hell for leather from one regimental headquarters to the next shouting at the top of his lungs that Bobby Lee had finally surrendered at Appomattox, and one war-weary old lifer shouted back, well, great God damn, you're the son of a bitch we've been looking for all these four years. Or the positive whoop -ha of extraordinary, deeply satisfying anger that rose from sitting bulls thousands as they rode down and killed every last one of General Custer's 7th Cavalry, which, years later, Cheyenne Chief Two Moon said took about as much time as a hungry man to eat his dinner. That's a quote. And one more thing. <clears throat> and this, I'll just keep this short. Ever since the end of the war, uh, there's been this odd mythology that simply will not die, that we could have won the war if only we had done this or that or this other thing. Where did this bizarre notion come from? To say that we could have won the war is the same as saying we didn't fill our hearts with enough hate. We didn't dispatch enough of their wounded with large enough caliber uh, pistol shots. Didn't drop enough of them out of helicopters at a thousand feet. 
didn't burn enough villages, didn't butt fuck enough of their women, didn't bomb them far enough back into the Stone Age. Thanks. Thanks very much, Larry. The title of Tim O'Brien's 1973 memoir, If I Die in a Combat Zone, Box Me Up and Ship Me Home, is certainly familiar to all of us who ever had a run in platoon formation. But it was his Vietnam War novel, Going After Cacciato, which won the 1979 National Book Award and first made him a household name. He upped the ante again in 1990 when The Things They Carried placed him alongside Hawthorne, Faulkner, and Salinger as required reading for high school English students across the country. In 1994, Time Magazine chose O'Brien's In the Lake of the Woods as the best novel of the year, and in 2005, the New York Times named The Things They Carried one of the 22 best books of the last quarter century. The American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2010 presented Tim with the Catherine Ann Porter Award for a Distinguished Lifetime Body of Work. In 2012, he received the Dayton Peace Prize, and in 2013, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pritzker Military Library. Tim's novels have sold more than three and a half million copies and have been translated into over 20 languages. And although he holds an endowed chair at Texas State University, we're currently pressuring him to wear a Rice Owls baseball cap on his next book jacket photo. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Tim O'Brien. Oh, what a great honor to be here tonight. I want to acknowledge that the audience tonight is just as distinguished as the people up in front of you. Carl Marlanes, Bill Broyles, Ben Fountain are here, three incredibly distinguished American writers, so we ought to... <laughs> and then there are, there are all, the, uh, all those veterans among us who uh, I think all of us have come to like, if not love, in our short, short stay here. Smart people, serious people. Uh, committed people, uh, and fun to be with people. When she was nine, my daughter Kathleen asked if I'd ever killed anyone. She knew about the war. She knew I'd been a soldier. You keep writing these war stories, she said, so I guess you must have killed someone. It was a hard moment, but I did what I thought was right, which was to say, of course not and then to take her on my lap and just hold her for a while. Someday, I hope, she'll ask again. But here, I want to pretend she's a grown-up. I want to tell her exactly what happened, or what I remember happening. And then, I want to say to her that as a little girl, she was absolutely right. This is why I keep telling war stories. He was a short, slender young man of about 20. I was afraid of him, afraid of something. And as he passed me on the trail, I threw a grenade that landed at his feet and killed him. Or to go back. Shortly after midnight, we moved into the ambush site outside a little village called Mike. The whole platoon was there, maybe 30 of us, spread out in the dense brush along the trail. And for five hours, nothing at all happened. We were working in two-man teams, one man on guard while the other slept, switching off every two hours. And I remember it was still dark when my friend Kiowa shook me awake for the final watch. The night was foggy and hot, for the first few moments, I felt lost, not sure about directions, groping for my helmet and my weapon. I reached out and found three grenades and lined them up in front of me. The pins had already been straightened for quick throwing. And then, for maybe half an hour, I kneeled there in the dark and waited. Very gradually, in tiny slivers, Dawn began to break through the morning fog. And from my position in the brush, 
I could see 10 or 15 meters up the trail. The mosquitoes were fierce. I remember slapping at them, wondering if I should wake up Kiowa and ask for some repellent, and then thinking that was a bad idea, and then looking up and seeing the young man come out of the morning fog. He wore black clothing and rubber sandals and a gray ammunition belt. His shoulders were slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side as if listening for something. He seemed at ease. He carried his weapon in one hand, muzzle down, moving without any hurry up the center of the trail. There was no sound at all, none that I can remember. In a way, it seemed he was part of the fog, or part of my own imagination. But there was also the reality of what was happening in my stomach. I had already pulled the pin on a grenade. I had come up to a crouch. It was entirely automatic. I did not hate the young man. I did not see him as the enemy. I did not ponder issues of morality or politics or military duty, none of that. I just crouched and kept my head down. I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. I was terrified. There were no thoughts about killing. The grenade was to make him go away, just evaporate. And I leaned back and felt my head go empty, and then felt it fill up again. The brush was thick, and I had to lob it high, not aiming. And I remember that grenade seeming to freeze above me for just an instant, as if a camera had clicked. And I remember ducking down, and holding my breath, and seeing little wisps of fog rise from the earth. The grenade bounced once and rolled across the trail. I did not hear it, but there must have been a sound, because the young man dropped his weapon and began to run, just two, three quick steps. Then he stopped, and turned to his right, looked down at the grenade, and tried to cover his head, but never did. It occurred to me then that he was about to die. I wanted to warn him. The grenade made a popping noise. Not soft, but not loud either. Not what you'd expect. And there was a puff of dust and smoke, a small white puff. And the young man seemed to jerk upward as if pulled by invisible wires. He fell on his back. His rubber sandals had been blown off. He lay at the center of the trail. His right leg bent beneath him. His one eye shut, his other eye a huge star-shaped hole. For me, it was not a matter of live or die. I was in no danger. Almost certainly the young man would have passed me by that day. And it will always be that way. Later, I remember Kiowa trying to tell me that the man would have died anyway. He told me it was a good kill. He told me I was a soldier, this was a war, and that I should shape up and stop staring.
and ask myself what the dead man would have done if things were reversed. But you see, none of that mattered. The words were way too complicated. Even now, four decades later, I have not finished sorting it out. Sometimes I forgive myself. Other times, I don't. In the ordinary hours of life, I try not to dwell on it. But now and then, when I'm reading a newspaper, or just sitting alone in a room, I'll look up and I'll see the young man step out of the morning fog. I'll watch him walk toward me, his shoulders slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side, and he'll pass within a few yards of me and suddenly smile at some secret thought and then continue up the trail to where it bends back into the morning fog. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. And last but not least, in 1993, the producers of the film This Boy's Life had a problem. Where could they find an actor handsome and charismatic enough to portray Tobias Wolf? <laughs> Ultimately, as you know, they were forced to settle uh, for Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> as a pale, pale imitation of the genuine article. But happily, we don't have to make that compromise tonight. Beginning with this trailblazing short story collection, In the Garden of North American Martyrs, Tobias Wolfe has made a forceful and prolific impact on American literature. He's the author of the best-selling novels Old School and The Barracks Thief, in addition to his 1994 memoir about his time as a Green Beret in Vietnam in Pharaoh's Army. After 17 years at Syracuse University, Wolfe moved to Stanford University in 1997, where he teaches English and creative writing as the Ward W. and Priscilla B. Woods Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences. Toby has received too many honors to name, including the Penn Faulkner Award, Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Penn Malamud Award, and the Ray Award, the Academy Award, effectively, in literature from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. And, as you may have seen, have seen tomorrow, Toby will be at the White House to receive this year's na very prestigious National Medal of the Arts for Lifetime Achievement from Pre President Obama. Please join me in welcoming Toby Wolf. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say, as others have said, um, what a, uh, an, an extraordinary uh, time this has been, uh, not only to uh, swap lives with these people, but, uh, but to meet uh, the veteran students that Rice has so brilliantly drawn to itself. You're an object of envy for someone who teaches at Stanford. We're trying to do something of what you're doing here to take advantage of this incredible uh, uh, pool of talent and experience and conviction that uh, you've been smart enough to, to and uh, uh, I'm not nostalgic at all for my days in uniform, but the one thing that kind of gave me a twinge of that was to be in the company of these people and to share that sense of dark absurdity, which uh, is a special kind of gift of those who uh, um, have been uh, where they've been and done what they've done. Uh, I'm going to read a short section from a memoir called In Pharaoh's Army. And uh, the context for this is I was uh, an advisor to a Vietnamese uh, unit in the Delta. And one day, one of the, uh, there we were in an operation, and one of the units was, uh, uh, of the Vietnamese units, was uh, very badly uh, chewed up and ambushed. And 
uh, I happened to be, uh, along with another uh, uh, lieutenant, American lieutenant in the Vietnamese uh, headquarters when the call for help came in. They needed an American to go out and to uh, help direct medevacs and, uh, and air support to try to get these Vietnamese troops out of the fix they were in. The American colonel, uh, who was head of the advisors, happened to be standing next to a guy I didn't know very well, Keith Young, had his hand on his shoulder while this was going on, and there he was, and he turned to him and said, well, uh, Keith, what do you think? As if it were a real question. And so Keith suits up and goes out, and he was killed later that day. So, uh, of course, one thinks about this afterwards, and I was very well aware that uh, had I been standing next to the colonel at that time, it would have been me that his fatherly hand had been resting on, and me to whom he put that question, what do you think? I once confessed, uh, well, so you sometimes get this idea that people like Keith and others uh, had somehow pecked up my cards and stood in the place where I was meant to stand. I once confessed this dreary notion to someone who, meaning well, told me it was caveman talk. I know, I said, but still, but still. In a place and time where the most consequential things happen by chance or from unfathomable causes, you don't look to reason for help. You consort with mysteries. You encourage yourself with charms, omens, rites of propitiation. Without your knowledge or permission, the bottom line caveman belief in blood sacrifice, one life buying another, begins to steal into your bones. How could it not? All around you, people are killed. Soldiers on both sides, farmers, teachers, mothers, fathers, schoolgirls, nurses, your friends, but not you. They have been killed instead of you. This observation is unavoidable. So in time is the corollary implicit in the word instead, in place of. They have been killed in place of you, in your place. You don't think it out, not at the time, not in those terms, but you can't help but feel it, and go on feeling it. It's the close call you have to keep escaping from, the unending doubt that you have a right to your own life. I didn't really know Keith Young. We saw each other in Mito, now and then exchanged a few words, but we didn't take it any farther than that. He was quiet, careful, he struck me, I have to admit, as a company man. And it was pretty clear that I'd made no better impression on him. We never spent any time together until by chance we ran into each other while boarding the Kowloon Ferry in Hong Kong. I'd been on R&R &R for four or five days already, and Keith had just arrived. He was on his way to a tailor he'd heard about, and invited me to join him. This tailor was incredible, he said. For $30, he could copy any suit. All you had to do was show him a picture of it. Keith had several pictures, advertisements he'd cut out of Esquire. You could pick up the suits in 24 hours. I didn't have anything better to do, so I went along with Keith and watched him being fitted for his wardrobe. At first, I found the whole thing comical, especially a sign in the window of the shop, guaranteed by the Royal Navy. I liked the idea of the Royal Navy taking an interest in my duds. Wow. And then I began to think it wasn't that bad a deal, 30 bucks, and that it wouldn't hurt to have a few good suits and the odd sport coat hanging around. Before leaving the shop that day, I placed some orders of my own, for clothes that did not, in fact, resemble the ones in Esquire, and which quickly began to fall apart because of inferior thread. 
One of my suit sleeves actually came off inside my overcoat as I was arriving at a house for a dinner party. <laughs> I considered sending a letter of complaint to the First Lord of the Admiralty, <laughs> but never did. My haul was modest compared to Keith's. He ordered six or seven suits, tweed jackets, button-down shirts of every acceptable color. He seemed bent on getting the whole clothes problem out of the way forever, right then and there. We hit a few clubs that night, and he couldn't stop talking about what a great deal he'd gotten. And that I th was a thought I had when I heard he'd been killed. What about all those clothes? It was a gasp of a thought, completely instinctual, without malice or irony. All those clothes waiting for him, they seemed somehow an irrefutable argument for his survival. Maybe they'd seem that way to him, too, a kind of guarantee, like the wives and fiancés some of us accumulated just before leaving home. They gave us a picture of ourselves in time to come, a promise of future existence to use as a safe conduct pass through the present. I sometimes tried to imagine other men wearing Keith's suits, but I couldn't bring the images to life. What I see instead is a dark closet with all his clothes hanging in a row. Someone opens the closet door, looks at them for a time, and closes the door again. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, all of you, for, uh, for those uh, very inspiring readings. I wanted to get this off, get this started off. Um, since you mentioned the audience here, we've got a number of influential people. We've got civilians, we've got veterans who've seen combat, veterans who haven't, young people, uh, more mature people. I wonder if you all have an, a specific audience in mind. Maybe Phil, I'll direct the question to you. Thoughts? Audience in mind when you're writing about Vietnam, or comrades, or enemies. Younger selves, never seen war? And if so, what's the message that you try to communicate? Uh, well, I, I, I felt a compulsion to write Rumor of War, but to tell you the truth, I don't quite know why I felt that compulsion. It was just something that would not let me go. Um, uh, in this, uh, this was the 20th, I think, anniversary edition of it. I, I did an afterword explaining why I wrote it, but I, I tend to think that I invented the reasons I wrote it uh, after having written it <laughs> rather than before. Um, I, I, I think the audience, though, I did have in mind was, uh, was the American public at that time. Um, the, uh, I think most everybody here is, was uh, probably not even born then, but um, um, the country was very, very bitterly divided. Uh, everybody had an opinion about the war. Um, there had been books written about it that were, tended to be either polemical um, or were these kind of journalistic accounts. And I, what I wanted to do was get across the emotional and psychological truth of the war by getting across its physical truth. In other words, what I tried to do was I tried to create a what we would today, today call a virtual tour of duty for anybody who picked up the book and read it. So they could feel the heat, the monsoon rains banging down on your head, the, the mosquito bites, the elephant grass slashing your face, all of these concrete realities so that when somebody finished the book, uh, they would say to themselves, now what do I think? Now what's my opinion? Uh, and, uh, and, and the book does, uh, I can't go into it now, it's going to take too long, but, but it concludes with a, a kind of moral lesson, so to speak, is that I discovered within myself a capacity 
for darkness and violence uh, that I never knew was in me. Uh, and, um, and I realized as I was writing the book that that side of me uh, came out as partly as a result of all these experiences that I've just been describing, the actual physical experiences. And I wanted someone also to read the book and then make their own moral judgment. And not only say about what do I think, you know, but if I had been in those circumstances, how would I have behaved? Would I have been, would I have done the noble and right thing? Or would I have done something else? And um, um, that, I, that was the audience I had in mind, but nobody, no specific demographic. Bring up the concept of truth, which I think is a very interesting one. Um, about the, the kind of personal and, and the role. Um, sorry. Bill mentioned truth, and Tim certainly writes famously about the, the purpose of a war story and, and the role of truth. Maybe I can ask you to comment on truth and, <laughs> and really the role it has to play in, in telling a war story. Well, uh, I'm, the, I'm the last guy. To, I'm a novelist. My job is to lie for a living. <laughs> so I'm not sure that I'm the person to be asking about this. Uh, I, don't, I don't know quite how to address it. I mean, uh, truth is this elusive and fluid, ever-changing. I mean, think of your own lives. Do you believe the same things now about the Easter Bunny that you used to? I... Hope not, but I doubt it very much that our our personalities tr change, the truths change, even about ourselves, much less our sense of truths about the rest of the world. How ask Copernicus, uh, Galileo, I mean, go through and then ask Einstein after those two, and the truth is truths in the physical world have changed, or what we think of as truth, and I'm sure they'll change in the future. Uh, in a war, truth seems to me especially elusive. Um, I, like, like Phil just said, discovered things about myself that I thought were not only unknown, but Im impossible. I could not behave the way I found myself behaving, partly out of frustration, partly out of terror, uh, partly out of love for my fellow soldiers, doing things in the name of love that were pretty sinful and evil things. And uh, so I come home from a war finding myself uh, confused about the truth about even who, who this human being is. And the things they carried is essentially an effort to, to grapple with the, this elusive, slick, sumo wrestler monster could we call truth it's always sliding away from us uh, wars are always I think billed to us as 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 they're sold to us as pending catastrophes if we don't go kill people horrible things will ensue and they may loss of freedom loss of you no know, democratic whatever it might be uh, I I'm wearing tonight a shirt that my wife bought for me in Austin Texas at a JC Penney off of I-35 in South Park Meadows, near Onion Creek in Austin. On the, the back of the shirt, there's a little tab that says, Made in Vietnam, from a J.C. Penney. <laughs> and I'm thinking, catastrophe? Where, where's the fucking catastrophe? We're, we lost the war! And we're buying shirts made in Vietnam, and we got... Who knows how many dead Vietnamese? We say three million, the Vietnamese say five million. That's a lot of dead people to be buy buying shirts at J.C. Penney's as the consequence of it. And we lost. That's the bad outcome of the war. We're buying J.C. Penney shirts. So the issue, of that, that, that's simplistic, that little anecdote. That, that's complicated. We could talk way beyond it on both sides of the question. Um, the effort of a novelist is really, in the end, I think, not to uh, proclaim truths or explain truths, but to do almost the opposite, to investigate the mysterious r richness of 
of uh, human potential in this world, and plus and the minus side both, the good stuff and the bad, uh, it, with the knowledge that truth is going to remain elusive. Toby, do you think there is uh, glory, honor in war? Not a reason to do it, but um, yeah, I mean, in the very ways that, that Tim, Tim described, the, uh, um, the kind of loyalty and uh, courage on behalf of others that can be called up in a, um, in a situation of war, uh, yes, but it is, uh, it's always qualified by those things that uh, um, you do in all those other moments. And it's, uh, I, I frankly found the whole thing very corrupting myself. To, to myself, uh, and um, and at this, you know, while um, maybe even occasionally finding resources in myself that uh, that uh, in retrospect I thought were were admirable, but uh, but it, it it's all circumstantial. It really is, and and uh, you know Hemingway has that wonderful passage about you know he he can't stand. These words like honor and glory, that all that matters to him were the names of the, of the places where men were killed, the names of the villages that were destroyed. And that's the concrete reality of this. So, uh, uh, yes, I mean, people rise to extraordinary occasions uh, in, their own, in their own nature that they might not even have suspected, but also in ways they will surprise themselves in ways that they will think about with shame the rest of their lives as well. So um, glory and honor and all that sort of thing are, are, uh, are, are what you try, have to uh, uh, try to attain when you are in that situation. That is, uh, but uh, it's, boy, it's sure not a reason to go to war. Would your answer, for any of you, would your answer have changed if I'd asked 18-year-old uh, Toby Wolf? Would you have had a different impression, or is that, is that completely formed by your experience there? Oh, I was pretty naive when I was 18. I mean, uh, again, there's a context for everything, and the social context of, of my growing up in a largely working-class atmosphere was that all the men that I knew when I was growing up had served in World War II, and a great many had also served in Korea. And uh, uh, it just seemed to me always when I was growing up that it was something that you did. It was like a base you touched somehow in your life. And, and, uh, uh, it, it, uh, and of course, with all the movies we saw and that kind of thing, Without our thinking much about it, there were, you know, you did see it as, a, as an opportunity to somehow distinguish yourself and, and the ways you're talking about. But that, that certainly, uh, um, it wasn't my motive when I went in. I enlisted when I was 18, largely because I pretty much screwed up my life at that point. I hadn't gotten before a judge yet to tell me to go in, but um, I didn't have a high school diploma. I wasn't. I didn't have any prospects. I figured I was going to be going in anyway at some point. Better do it before I had a wife and kids. Um, it, was pretty, it was pretty much like that. Get this out of the way. And I ended up being in for, for four years. And, and, uh, and of course, the minute you sign the dotted line, all kinds of things are going to happen that you didn't expect. <laughs> That's kind of the deal. Um, so a lot of things happened that I didn't expect. Uh, but... Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't enlist, honestly, out of warrior zeal or an appetite for glory. I didn't, actually. Larry, how about you? Did you find any honor in your experience? Uh, not for a minute. Uh, uh, as I said before, I, uh, I was drafted. Uh, uh, I'm born and raised, lived all my life in Chicago. There is no martial tradition in my family. Uh, my father was 4F uh, and felt ashamed of that. 
Uh, and by the time it, uh, I finished high school uh, and went to college uh, for the deferment, uh, this was, well, the early 60s, middle 60s, uh, ran out of money. Uh, five months later, uh, myself and my younger brother, who was two and a half years younger than I, got our draft notices in the same uh, 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 mail, uh, went down for our physicals, got on the train, went down to Fort Polk, Louisiana, and just as a parenthesis, well, uh, uh, we were in the same training company, the same platoon, the same uh, uh, squad, the same barracks. Our bunks uh, were next to each other, and our father wrote very uh, sort of newsy, chit-chatty family stuff. He was not very articulate. I would get the original and Richard would get the carbon copy. <laughs> Richard was brother number three, so he always was getting the carbon. Uh, I, I was 23. I wasn't, I wasn't 18. Uh, as I said before, I, uh, I was distinctly uh, not interested in being in the army. Uh, and the kind of uh, uh, sort of everyday, ordinary, garden variety, bullshit harassment that, uh, that we were treated to uh, was, uh, offended me. Uh, I've always thought uh, then and all since, that uh, as a general thing, I never encountered so many stupid people in my life. <laughs> there was a guy. Uh, uh, I can say his name now because he's probably dead. And I and actually this evening I really don't care what, if he's going to sue me or not, because he's going to have to stand up in court and say yes, I am that person. Drill Sergeant Scovey, S-C-O-V-E-Y, was maybe the dumbest person I have ever met. Now, Richard and I are, we're brothers. I'm half a head taller than he is. But, we, well, let me preface it by saying that uh, it was not uncommon for twins to be drafted identical twins, and they would go through basic training, and because of the Sullivan Rule, which is a holdover from World War II, the brothers would be separated. I went to Fort Knox, and uh, Richard went to Fort Sill for the artillery, and actually wound up on a cruising missile uh, crew in, in Hamburg. Well, that's a story for another time. But Scovey... But oh, we had the you know the green shirts and uh, the white name tags, and we stood next to each other in formation. And Scovey had the Yogi Bear hat, the campaign hat, which uh, now that I look back on it was maybe the most handsome piece of uniform I'd ever seen. I I wish I would have had one. They're really cool hats. But Scovey, you know, wears it down, so he's got a sort of a look at and he's, you know, they're all mean and, you know, they talk bluff, gruff. And he would look at Richard, and he'd look at me, and he'd look at Richard, and he'd look at me, and he'd look at Richard, and he'd look at me, and he'd say, when I figure out what you two squirrels are up to, because we both had the same Heinemann, you know, in large black and white letters. Okay? When I figure out what you two are up to, you're in big trouble. <laughs> we tried to explain to him. <laughs> We're brothers, yes, but we are not twins. 
And Scovey absolutely refused to believe it. <laughs> I, I, I was in awe of his stupidity. And <laughs> all these years later, still in awe. Larry, I've got to ask okay. a question. This is a good one for yes. the audience. Given that, and I may, know, I, may, I may be able to predict your answer, would you do it again? Absolutely not. <laughs> How about the rest of you? I mean, it's been a formative experience in your lives, correct? Would you do it again, or is it an experience you would rather back and not have had? You're asking me? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I would. Would? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a time for candor and honesty. And, uh, yeah, I would. I, I, the reason I say that, it, it's all, I, I would say that when you ask a question like that, it almost, to me, is... Would you uh, would you be born again? Uh, because um, my experience of that was those three years was is that who I had been before that was pretty much demolished, and who I then became and and am now was 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 born in the war and as a result of the war. So in in, in a lot of ways, I say that I would. I, I, whoever I am now, um, um, it, I owe to that experience. Uh, and to tell you the truth, in a lot of ways, uh, because I, my own personal philosophy is, is that um, it is better to, to know your devils and know you have demons within you than to uh, pretend they don't exist or to ignore them. And I would not have learned that. And um, I, I, you know, with my own personal outlook and, and the way I've written and the kind of stuff I've written, I think that that's a critical lesson. So, yes, I'd probably, uh, I know I would, I would do it all over again. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 the better part of me would say, like Larry, no, I would never do it again. But it's so hypothetical that you can't do it. You can't say it again. For me to participate in the stuff that I participated in and witnessed both, I mean, it was evil. It was sinful. It was terrible stuff. It was killing people. And that's why I read the piece I read about tonight. Mm -hmm. A young man of my age, and he probably wanted to be there no more than I did. Right. And uh, he's dead. And dead forever. You can't wake him up. He'll always be dead. Like the other five million. Five million people. And you ask, do you, would you do it again? It's not me. It, veterans are too often looked upon as victims. But we're participants. There are two different way, angles you take. And uh, I would, my best self would say, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't participate in it again. I, I think it was wrong. But there is always this proviso of, of, of what if that you don't know until you're in it, until the draft notice comes in the mail, or your father looks you in the eye and says, are you going or are you not going? My father, who served in World War II in the Navy, in the South Pacific, until you're in the circumstances, the context of it, it's, uh, it's beyond knowing. It's too hypothetical. Yeah. One is a rhetorical answer that I gave you, the political stuff. The other is a personal answer. And the real answer is, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I, I feel much of what you said, Tim. Uh, I mean, also, even the screw-ups that led to my joining in the Army in the first place, do I really regret those, uh, even though, you know, they derailed my life in many ways, or at least the life I thought I was heading toward and wanted? Um, but if everything had not happened the way it did, I would not have met my wife. I would not have the three children that are the dearest thing in my life to me. And so... In some strange way, even the things that objectively you might regret have led you to this place that where you may feel actually, as I do, blessed. 
So you can't recall the past that way, and I can't really summon up the ability to think about it that way, you know? Like, I, would I do it again or wouldn't I? Um, it, 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 regret just doesn't work in that way for me. Yeah. I'm getting the hook here, but I've got one final question I'd like to pose to you all because I think it's an interesting <coughs> one. Uh, most of us veterans have witnessed acts of heroism, great and small, how do we celebrate heroes and acts of heroism without romanticizing war in a more general way? Um, I'll, you know, I'll just send it back. Uh, that, is, that is the great question, I think, uh, to, to recognize uh, those. I, and we were talking the other day about, uh, you know, reading. Some of us had read a book that we weren't all that crazy about having to do with the Gulf War in which the, um, it's sort of, I think, means to be an anti-war book, but what are the guys doing before they go out on an operation? They're watching Platoon, right? And Platoon is meant to be this great anti-war movie. It is, in fact. It's a great movie. Um, but even the things that people have written and depicted about war to try to dissuade us from doing it again perk up our interest in some way. And uh, uh, certainly, I joined the Army not just because I had, of course, I could have gotten some kind of a job or something. I'd had jobs. But I'd, I'd read Hemingway. I'd read Mailer. I'd read Eric Maria Remark. I'd read, uh, uh, you know, deeply in that literature. And there was no question at all that as even at that age, someone who was interested perhaps in being a writer, uh, definitely in fact in being a writer, that in some way I regarded that as an experience which would, uh, would be a kind of equipment for me as a writer, a clapper in the bell, if you will. And so it wasn't innocent, you know? I mean, there was a predatory uh, hunger for experience that can lead people into pretty strange paths. Uh, so it wasn't really quite as simple as I'd earlier, you know. These our motives are always a uh, human heart is a dark forest, isn't it? Anyone else any other comments on heroism? Um, well, I mean how how to how to recognize heroic acts without glorifying war is that I uh, I what I think of is um I can't quote him directly, but I had a journalist friend named Tim Page, who was a uh, famous war photographer. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, um, uh, and he was one of these wild men uh, of, of the late 60s. And, uh, and he, he said something like, something to the effect of, uh, somebody said that it, uh, were his pictures glamorizing war, even as graphic as they were. And he says, of course they are. And he said, it's bullshit to think that you cannot glamorize war. And I think that there is something in that whole experience that is inherently <coughs> attractive in some dark, satanic way, and that you cannot uh, take it out. You, you can't ignore it. Um, now, um, I don't think that heroes should be recognized in such a way that, that uh, they're told that uh, isn't it great you just you wasted 25 people with your machine gun or something like that isn't that terrific um but uh but um the idea that if somehow let's say you took people who had done heroic and valorous things and then hid them somewhere uh and gave there was a secret private medal ceremony in the closet of the east room or something um uh, I still think that war would ne nevertheless still be attractive because I think there's something inherently attractive in it. And I think that to try to deny that uh, is a mistake. Well, again, I apologize. Uh, we're now over time. Uh, the Authors will be across the terrace, as a reminder, uh, signing books. We're going to proceed immediately there out the back door here. If you guys will stay seated for just a minute and let us uh, wander out the door. But before we do that, please join me in thanking them.